So as I said, what we're going to do to start with is we're going to try and contrast these two pictures that Kirky talks about. And the really important part of the pictures is that not only do the pictures contain a view of meaning, but they also contain a sort of metasemantic view. Remember we said like a metasemantic question is how does something get its meaning? So a metasemantic question about names is like, well, how does a name get the meaning that it has? And Kripke is not only going to offer us a very different semantic picture, he's going to be going back to the million picture of names, but he's going to be giving us a different metasemantic picture as well. And in some ways he thinks that it's a difference in views on the metasemantic question that's one of the really important things in the background between the description theory on the one hand and the causal picture that he's going to offer on the other. So let's start off by talking about how he thinks about the description view. Because in this very interesting passage, what he does is he says, this is basically how I think that people who like the description theory of names, this is how they see naming as working. This is how they think names basically come about, how, they, how it comes about that names mean things. So here's what he says. I want to name an object. I think of some way of describing it uniquely. And then I go through, so to speak, a sort of mental ceremony. By Cicero, I shall mean the man who denounced Catiline. And that's what the reference of Cicero will be. I will use Cicero to designate rigidly the man who, in fact, denounced Catiline. So I can speak of possible worlds in which he did not. But still, my intentions are given by first giving some condition which uniquely determines an object, and then using a certain word as a name for the object determined by this condition. So this is kind of the idea that we saw in Russell in some ways. So the idea is, well, how does a name pick out an object? How are we able to use, understand the meaning of a name? And the idea is, well, in general, what we do is we try to pick, we try to find some description that fits the person, and we use that description to fix the meaning of the name. Now here, he's talking, when we talk about fix the meaning of the name, we're going to be a little bit ambiguous. Because remember, as we said last time, there's kind of two different variations on the Frege-Russell theory of names. There's sort of the more Fregean version of it, where names really do refer they just also have this description component. And then there's the Russellian version, where names don't actually refer at all, they're just descriptions, and descriptions don't refer. But nonetheless, no matter, whichever way you're thinking about it, the basic view, you could see that either of these views uh, could be motivated by this big picture thought about how naming happens. The big picture thought being, well, in order to start trying to talk about an object, you first find out a way to, to sort of zoom in on it using a particular description and that fixes the meaning of the name either by fixing the reference or by just actually being the meaning of the name. So that's the way that Kripke is seeing the description theory. This is the, the picture he thinks is motivating people when they give the description theory. It's really important I think at this point to contrast what the description picture is saying with what Kripke's own causal picture is going to say. He offers what he's going to call a causal theory of name or causal picture of naming. And here's how he describes it in another interesting passage. He says, well, an initial baptism takes place. That's the first step of the theory. Here the object may be named by ostension. Ostension is basically just pointing at something. Or the reference of the name might be fixed by a description. We already know what that means. When the name is passed from link to link, that is from person to person, the receiver of the name must, I think, intend when he learns it to use it with the same reference as the man from whom he learned it, from whom he heard it. So let's think about that and how it differs from the description theory. The initial stage is sort of similar. So he thinks when, when a name sort of comes into existence, it latches on to a particular object, it's referent, either because we, we stipulate that using by pointing, we say, well, we're just going to, the name is going to apply to that thing. Or we say, well, the name is going to apply to whoever satisfies this description. But it's what happens next that's really different between the description theory and the causal theory. Because remember, as we said, when we talked about Russell, Russell thinks that everybody has to know the, the description associated with the name. It's not just whoever com comes up with the name, it's that anybody needs to know that description, needs to know that it applies to the object in order to understand the meaning of the name. And this is where there's a big difference with Kripke, because this is not what's going to happen with Kripke. What Kripke is saying is, well, once the name has, has sort of come into existence, once we've given it a particular referent, 
either using ostension, pointing, or using a description, then it's just settled that that's what the name refers to. And in particular, people who later on come to know the meaning of the term, who sort of glom on to how to use it, they themselves don't have to know the description. They don't have to know the facts that made the name mean what it does. They don't have to know that that's who you're pointing at. They don't have to know the description you use to fix the name. In fact, all that matters, he thinks, is that the people later on stand in the right causal relationship to the initial baptism. That is, they intend to use it in the same way as the person doing the baptizing does. I'm just going to take one more second on this to really to try and draw out how it how this picture differs from the description theory. Uh, and the one way to do that is to draw an actual picture. So we're going to imagine it's almost like a real baptism. We have a, a little baby and we're going to say the parent gives the, the child the name Alice or something. Should go that way. Okay, so obviously an oversimplified picture of how baptism works, but we're imagining the child gets the name Alice because the, po the parent just points at the child and says, well, Alice, that's the, name of, that's the name of this child now. So here the parent is using what we're calling ostension to fix the meaning of the name. But as I said, when it comes to the causal theory, what's really distinctive is what, it's what happens next. So we'll imagine that, you know, there are some other people who talk to the parent and they come to use the word Alice. And we're going to imagine, you know, their meaning picks out the same person. But it's the reason why their use picks out the same person that makes the theory distinctive. Because basically on Kripke's view, it's not because they have some description in mind that Alice, fix, that Alice fits. They may know very little about Alice. Rather, it's that they've been in conversation with this person. They've been in conversation with the person doing the baptizing. The parent, when they talk to other people, you know, introduces the name in conversation. They pick up on the name and then are then themselves able to use it. And then the chain sort of carries on. So suppose people who are more distant from the baptism talk to people at the second stage. And they come to use the word Alice. The word is still going to mean the baby, according to Kripke. But again, it's not because they have any description in mind that the baby fits. Rather, it's that they've been in conversation with people who've been in conversation with the people who did the baptizing. And they intend to use the, say, the name in the same way as the people that they got it from. And we can imagine the chain going on, so other people using the word Alice. And as you would expect, the further and further away you get from the initial baptism, the less and less people are going to know about the object. But unlike on the description theory, Kripke says this is no barrier to being able to understand the meaning of the name. Because all you've got to do is basically just intend to use the name in the same way as the people who who fixed the reference of the name of the first place. So you don't, know, you don't need to know what way that is, you just need to be intending, well, I'm using the name to refer to whoever they're referring to. So in, in a way, one way to think about the difference between these pictures is sort of like, what are the facts that are doing the fixing of the meaning of the name? Or what are the facts that fix the meaning of my particular use of a name? As we saw, Russell said that in order to understand the meaning of a name, you have to have this sort of description in your head that the object satisfies. This is not what's going on in the causal picture. Really what's happening in the causal picture is that, well, you have to stand in the right re causal relationship. You know, there have to be a chain of conversations going back to the original baptism, which link your use of the word to the original use of the word. And the important feature here is that, you know, once you go down the chain, the individual people don't have sort of a lot of control over what the over what the name means. It's this fact at the beginning, the ba that the baptism went a certain way, it's that sort of fact in the world that determines what the name means for the rest of its history, so long as the causal chain continues. And again, that's a really big difference with the description theory. Because the description theory idea was sort of like, well, we kind of have to, we have to kind of continue to sustain the reference of it as we go along using these descriptions. Um, because otherwise we wouldn't know what we were talking about. On this picture, 
we sort of don't need to know what we're talking about because the world does all the work for us. As long as we stand in the right causal relationship to, to the initial baptism, then we actually ourselves don't need to know very much about the object because it's not us knowing about the object. That's not what fixes the reference in the first place. It's being causally related to the baptism that fixes the reference in the first place. So as I think we can see at this stage, it's really clear that Kripke is just absolutely rejecting the Russellian acquaintance principle from last time. So this is a view where you can, you, you can talk about somebody using a name even if you know basically nothing about them. You just have to be intending to use the name in the same way as you know, the people that you got the name from, so to speak. And it's not like on this picture we're determining the reference of the names ourselves. The reference is determined by the initial baptism, and what everybody else does is just sort of latch on to that usage by standing in the right causal relationships with the, with, with, with the initial baptism through a chain of conversations going back to the original use of the name. And so you'll have guessed this view of names is very million. On, on what Kripke's arguing, all there is to the meaning of a name is just what it stands for. There's no connotation, there's no, there's no sense, there's no anything like that. And Kripke's thought is the reason why he doesn't have it is because, well, it actually turns out that it's just not necessary to have any of the, to have either sense or connotation or anything like this in order to fix the reference of a name. Uh, and in fact, those views look like they have lots of counterexamples, which is what Kripke's going to argue next. The important thing he thinks, and the only thing that's really necessary to understand the meaning of a name in most cases, is not to have some sense attached with it, is not to be acquainted with the thing it stands for, it's not to know it satisfies some description, it's for you to be in some sort of appropriate causal relationship to its baptism.